Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was a 7'2 basketball unicorn, an ideal offensive centerpiece who could score and pass, combined with a looming defensive presence in front of the rim. He's arguably the sport's most decorated player, three titles in college, six in the NBA, and a record six MVP trophies thanks to the game's most dominant weapon. But was he just the product of a weak era? Were his defensive criticisms valid? Or, when he put it all together at the peak of his powers, was he the best center of all time? You are watching what greatness is all about. Where's Larry Bird in all this? Has it blocked by Elijah Wong? Michael Jordan <laughs> saves the day. This series tackles one question. Who was the best at his best? We start at the ABA merger and go through the best multi-year stretches, examining the legends who provided the most on-court impact. These are the greatest peaks. Ford sends it to Kareem. Sky hook up and good. Lakers win. Score it. Kareem Abdul Jabbar. As a 1960s phenom in New York City, Kareem was friendly with Wilt Chamberlain, who we examined in the series Prelude. But he wasn't built to replicate Wilt's powerful scoring style. Jabbar's approach was crafted around his incredible height and graceful agility. He easily could have been listed at 7'3 or 7'4 if measured in shoes, but he wasn't some uncoordinated ent, instead moving like a smaller player. That athletic combination was enough in high school. He won two national titles and in college winning three national titles and famously bludgeoning the defending national champ varsity team at UCLA with his freshman squad. But to become a legend in the NBA, Jabbar needed a weapon that matched his physical makeup. That's right, the sky hook. This cloud scraping dance step was a basketball cheat code. We don't have tracking data on every one he flicked up over the years, but by my eye it grew sharper, sturdier, and more accurate as the 70s progressed. Kareem began adding weight to his lower body through the years, and by 1977 still had similar mobility to his college days with a much sturdier base. In his earlier years, physical defenders could interfere with his setup, that melodic left foot step to turn those shoulders at just the right launch angle. You can see his balance is disrupted here, but by 1977, another 10 or 15 pounds on his frame allowed him to find and hold his spots more easily, and he could comfortably hook right into defenders when crowded. We might take it for granted because it appears effortless, but it took years of samurai precision to forge this unique basketball sword. Defense has tried to stop it by blocking that left foot step, but Kareem could just step up court away from the hoop, almost like his version of a step back. Disrupting his rhythm or landing space could throw off the accuracy. That's a foul today, but not then. But otherwise, this was a high percentage attempt from just about anywhere inside 15 feet. As teams overplayed the hook, Kareem developed counters like a turnaround jumper. This probably felt like a win to most defenders, but with a high release point, it was another viable weapon. He also went to a lefty hook, although it lacked the devastation of the polished right-hander. Kareem also had that classic big man game, like finding deep position or using his size to just turn and shoot right over smaller defenders. Sometimes he'd just bust out a spin and drop the hammer. Who says big men are boring? Show yourself. This repertoire made Abdul-Jabbar the gold standard of scoring for the first 40 years of the league. If we adjust for inflation to today's norms, from 1977 to 1979, Kareem averaged 28 points every 75 possessions in the playoffs on efficiency 11.5% better than the opponent's defense. Only Reggie Miller has ever touched that kind of true shooting on such volume in the postseason, and only three players ever have scored at least 30 on plus 7% true shooting. This record-setting scoring forced opponents to react, which meant Kareem could set up his teammates. Entire defenses bent toward him, there's four in his airspace, and since the 77 Lakers lacked players who could create their own offense, a few extra feet for a jumper made a difference. He could skip it cross-court like this to find an open opportunity. 
New Laker coach Jerry West constructed an attack where Kareem was flanked with shooters who could benefit from his double teams, which wasn't as destructive as today's three-point specialists, but still provided value for secondary players back then. Without the ball, Jabbar even generated gravity because defenders were so preoccupied with him. During their 77 showdown, Bill Walton was reluctant to leave Jabbar at times. He's preoccupied with his movement here instead of his usual help at the rim. And here's Walton just face guarding him with a second defender dragged over, creating another open jumper. Kareem was also prolific finding cutters from these scoring hotspots. He wasn't the high post quarterback Walton was, Bill probably connects there, and he didn't have perfect feel for tight ones like this, but Jabbar had his share of impressive dimes. It didn't always feel organic, but he was such a studious player that once he learned a situation, he could exploit it. Kareem hit most of these little back doors and was comfortable with handoffs as well. And these late prime years were arguably his best as a passer. I think this play from his last great offensive season in 1980 sums him up as a playmaker, finding a teammate cross court, then taking a second, but still finding a great layup pass. He was also a strong outlet passer, firing like an outfielder when he could set up a teammate streaking down the court after a rebound. Kareem's childhood love of baseball no doubt influenced this pass, slinging bombs nearly the length of the court at times, and these one-handed outlets are a forgotten part of his game. All of this took him to heights Wilt could never reach on offense. He was a more efficient scorer because of far better free throw shooting, and he leveraged his scoring to help teammates. This guard is sitting on Kareem's hook, so he audibles to an open shooter. Also, this might be my favorite Kareem play ever, where he fakes the guard off his hook just to set it up, and look, he slaps his hands in disgust at the mere idea that he gave up a hook. Using our best estimates, Jabbar created five to six open shots per game for teammates like this by drawing extra defenders. Cream of the crop numbers until the late 80s, when superstars reached eight or nine shots created per game, and that gravity made things easier for teammates too. Wilt would often park himself on the block and clog any driving lanes, but Kareem could flow into different spots in the paint to catch and score, and this offensive variety allowed teammates to fit more comfortably around his postgame. From 1977 to 79, the Lakers finished about two points ahead of league average on offense without an abundance of offensive talent, a testament to Kareem's ability to raise a team's offensive floor. But Jabbar also fit next to better players on championship-level attacks. In 1980, when more talent arrived with Jim Jones, Michael Cooper, and Magic Johnson, and in the early 70s with the Bucks next to Bobby Dandridge and the aging Oscar Robertson. Robertson missed 18 games in 1973 and 74, and the Bucks actually improved their scoring differential by three points without him, playing around a 70-win pace, strong evidence that prime Kareem could captain an elite offense with decent perimeter talent around him. Well, I don't think he could have replicated Walton's high post passing in Portland's system, the Lakers' offense in 1977, with its own cast of dependent players around Jabbar, was almost as efficient as the Blazers, and no big man could replicate those high-end offenses built around Kareem for decades. Here's every offense since 1955, where the team leader in offensive load, that is, the player doing the most heavy lifting, was a big man. Those high-end offenses built around the sky hook stand out, and Kareem's team stayed above water when the surrounding talent was bare. It's only in the mid-90s that names like Barkley, Malone, and Shaq led comparable regular season offenses that were built around big men. The bigger question about Abdul-Jabbar back then, and historically, is more about his defense, and how much it actually held him back. I think you're the greatest, but my dad says you don't work hard enough on defense. 30 years after retiring, Kareem is still third all-time in block shots, despite the stat not being tracked in his first four seasons. That incredible length helped him defend the rim well, making basic shots difficult for finishers with his giant SWAT radius. And on some of these rim contests, he got way up. There's another one of those baseball outlets for an easy score, but he occasionally had problems judging goaltending when he was so high. 
Kareem loved to spring off his left foot like this, taking a big plant step and extending the right hand to slap the ball. And that made for some incredible saves. Look at how gracefully he recovers for this chase down block. The downside of this left leg right hand two step is that it requires time to unwind. And in more traditional vertical situations, he couldn't always target releases perfectly. At times he's organizing his feet to jump, but then an extra dribble throws him off and he can't react in time. Same thing here, a touch late responding, so the window to load up and jump is too small, and that is Kobe Bryant's dad, ladies and gentlemen. Reaction time was an issue for Kareem. He bites on a fake here and then lacks a quick burst from two feet without clearly seeing the shot. This entire play, he's a frame behind, the head turning to the ball late, frozen by the pump fake, then swiping at air after the ball's gone. This is a subtle issue, but pedestrian reflexes chipped away at some of his defensive value. Here's one where his hands are down and he's frozen, expecting a shot, not a pass. But again, that lag in reaction time prevents a possible save. His motor played a role too. He logged so many minutes with a heavy offensive load that there wasn't gas left in the tank for bouncing around on every single defensive trip. This shows up in his defensive rebounding, where he was notably inconsistent about boxing out, often just relying on his huge reach to grab boards. His size alone made him a good rebounder, but a higher revving engine would have made him a great one. In those moments he shifted into overdrive, the flashes were impressive, blending his size and athleticism into a human wall at the basket. His hands weren't always up, but he could make great plays with that length, when he was determined to react and put forth multiple efforts on a play. Also, legendary traveling signal. Kareem didn't have many overt defensive breakdowns, and even when seeding ground, he could still reach many shots. So many of those were long distance blocks, the kind that erase an attempt but don't prevent one. The very best paint defenders deter the highest percentage shots from even being taken, and so it's ironic that Kareem averaged more blocks per game than Bill Walton while appearing to contest fewer shots. Some of Kareem's best defensive possessions weren't even blocks. Here he alters Rick Barry's attempt, and then defending the pass freezes Barry into a travel. Abdul-Jabbar was also fairly mobile outside the paint for his time. There just weren't many jitterbugs who could punish him on switches, although again, there's no second effort here for a rebound, and it's a putback score. Yet these old school pick and rolls were a strength of his, sliding down to help or sometimes out to a guard when needed and moving with him comfortably. His feet weren't cat quick, but his general mobility was superb in these spots for his era. He wasn't always aware of all the threats around him. He telescopes in on the ball here, but completely loses his man behind him although his strong rim protection clearly made him a defensive asset. If we examine Kareem's missed games in the middle of the 1970s, the same method from last episode, we can estimate just how impactful his defense and overall game were. In 37 missed games, Kareem's team stumbled to a negative 2.9 adjusted point differential, about a 32 win pace for a season, and with him they played at a positive 3.6 differential or a 52 win pace. It's not quite the absurdity of Walton's unique impact in Portland, but the story is the same in both Milwaukee in 1975 and LA in 1978, making it less likely he was situationally lucky and that his impact was in line with the all-time greats. In a highly competitive league in the middle of the 70s with teams packed together, Kareem's two-way value lifted likely lottery teams to fringe contender status. By the way, we have to take some liberties with those 1978 games he missed because LA made a number of trades afterwards, but that seems fair given how those other pieces didn't move the needle. For instance, in 28 games without Jamal Wilkes, the Lakers were even better, playing at a 55-win pace. Adrian Dantley's fit on the team was also questionable, eating away post-possessions from Kareem. Without Jabbar, those teams primarily suffered on offense, echoing what we see on tape, his defense is still good enough though to include him among the sacred peaks. We should also note that his post defense had similar strengths and weaknesses to his paint help. His size definitely bothered big men who couldn't stretch him away from the hoop, but he avoided banging a lot. See that little separation he yields? 
and again the reaction is a bit slow on this turnaround. Here's a clearer look. Notice how he pulls away with his hips instead of holding ground, and that's a decent contest, but this technique allows for too much freedom and space and can easily backfire. Hey, it's Big Red. If we ran the same numbers for Kareem that we did for Walton against all-star centers in the mid-1970s, the results would be more pedestrian. He shaved about two points off their normal true shooting. Although remember, Kareem never really had a bruising partner like Maurice Lucas to play alongside of. Off-court personality aside, it's easy to see how Kareem's defensive weaknesses and his cheat code offense could produce criticism despite incredible on-court results. He simply made it look too easy at times. In many ways, his outlying height, dexterity, and studiousness made him the ideal two-way player of his time. Big man defense combined with offensive impact that wings struggled to match before the spacing of the three-point era. Our one-number metrics that reach back in time have him competing with just about the best multi-year stretches on record. PIPM also has him in the top 10 here, using 1976 to 1978. Sure, he could have had a better motor or sharper reflexes, but that might have just been unfair. He won six MVPs anyway and made 11 all-defensive teams, most of them warranted in my estimation. And so for me, he might have peaked on defense in Milwaukee with those younger legs under him, but the ascension of his offensive game, the robotic, soul-sucking mastery of the sky hook, and that arsenal of counters make Kareem Abdul-Jabbar one of the five best centers in NBA history at his peak. For more historical content and to support this channel, head over to patreon.com slash thinkingbasketball and check out Thinking Basketball the book on Amazon. That goes deeper on a number of ideas explored in this series. There are also longer discussions on many of these players on the Thinking Basketball podcast. And if you're curious about stats from this video, there's an entire stat series on this channel. Otherwise, thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this one and that wherever you are, you're having a great day. Here's a disparity in the call. They're going to give the ball to Detroit. Bird steals it. Johnson, layup, Boston. One second left.